I was too young to understand what was going on. But West Wing reruns were always a key part of the D'Antonio family media diet. As I got older, I stopped wanting to be a dinosaur when I grew up and decided that I wanted to be a West Wing staffer. I was attracted to this group of confident, intelli intelligent policy wizards who would change the world with eloquent speeches and hallway walk and talks. When I graduated high school, I decided that I wanted to be, I wanted to become the Josh Lyman I wanted to see in the world. I even went to school here in DC at the Catholic University of America so that every day I would be surrounded by that magical DC air that turns policy nerds into heroes. <laughs> when I was in school, I studied hard, I did internships, I even started a college radio station at my school. Everything I could think of to build the perfect resume. During my senior year, I sent out my resume to dozens of think tanks, nonprofits, and government offices. I didn't get any interviews anywhere. <laughs> Tried not to get discouraged, the months ticked by, and some of my friends started getting jobs, committing to grad schools. While I was getting emails, it all began with, thank you so much for your application, but. These were dark times, my friends. <laughs> to put it bluntly, I felt that I had failed. I was not going to be the Josh Lyman I had promised myself I would be. The rejection letters piled higher and higher, and my self-esteem sank lower and lower. On that scorching May day when I walked across the stage to get my diploma, I felt like a fraud. I had a piece of paper that said I had achieved something, but I felt like I had achieved nothing. For the first four months after graduation, my life was a country song. <laughs> I had no job, all my school friends were gone, and I didn't even have a dog to keep me company. <laughs> the dark times became the even darker times. I eventually did find a job that let me stay in DC, but not doing what I wanted. Instead of working on policy proposals and taking meetings on the Hill, I was what could best be described as an angry person handler for the sales division of a major cable company. If you called in the DC area, there's an entire likelihood you were yelling at me. People would call and yell at me because they thought that they were paying too much for cable. And I would soak up the anger and then transfer them on to my boss, who was actually empowered to fix the problem. Then occasionally my boss would yell at me because the people hadn't fully expelled their anger on me yet, and he had had to deal with them. Now, don't let my large stature and big beard fool you. I am not a tough person. I don't like to yell. I don't like to be yelled at. I am, after all, a Quaker. I knew that I couldn't keep doing this job. The even darker times were becoming the even, even, darker, darker, times, times. <laughs> the job was just wearing me down too much. But I knew that this job was the only way I could stay in DC and maybe someday get the chance to be the West Wing character I'd always promised myself that I would be. Luckily for me, past Joe had been looking out for me. My freshman year, I had gone to a Quaker meeting after a family friend described the manner of Quaker worship and I decided I just had to see it in action. Let's, we use the word action loosely. I felt something with Quaker meetings I had never felt before. Something that I hadn't felt in any other house of worship I'd ever been in before or since. I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't want to become a Quaker. I had been raised Catholic, and I knew that my life would be made immeasurably more complicated by becoming a Quaker. I tried my best to forget what I had felt at my first Quaker meeting, but I just couldn't shake that feeling. I went back intermittently for the next three years, and during worship, I had experience with the divine I never thought I would have. And during fellowship and meeting events, I met some of the warmest people I've ever known. As my senior year ended, I started getting more involved with my meeting and decided that I wanted to become a Quaker. As my work life got harder, I became even more involved with my meeting. The light of Quakerism helps to get me through the even, even, darker, darker, times, times, and make them just the dark times. I would not have been able to stay in D.C. without my meeting. I would have given up and gone home, but my meeting helped me make a home for myself here. Because of that home, I was able to find a different job that was a lot closer to what I wanted to do, and that job would eventually lead me here to FCNL. 
Just before starting FCNL, I became a full member at the Friends Meeting of Washington and one of the co-conveners for our Young Adult Friends group. I now take visits on the Hill and have conversations with staffers. Sometimes I even do it when I'm walking. <laughs> I may not be a West Wing staffer yet, but I'm making my way toward it. I've come to walk cheerfully over the world, just like George Fox told me that I would. Quakers talk a lot about the still small voice, that soft but persistent connection to the divine, always present and always guiding us toward what is right. Even in the darkest times, we all have that inner light to get us through. The light that led me to where I am now came from a Quaker meeting house in DuPont Circle. And I will forever be grateful to them and to all of you, my friends, for helping make the space I inhabit now and guide me to the places the light will lead me in the future. Thank you all very much. Yeah.